In the 1930s, Germany had abandoned democracy and embraced fascism. Its dictator, Adolf Hitler, was a militarist with visions of his country dominating Europe and the world. Its army and air force were now unrivaled. Many in the US government and the military believed that war with Nazi Germany was inevitable. But most Americans wanted nothing to do with another ground war in Europe. World War I had been a war of soldiers with rifles and artillery fighting for inches and dying in waves. I mean, we turned large areas of France into slaughter yards with trench warfare. And the futility of that trench warfare, guys climbing out of those trenches, going over the top, going into those barbed wire jungles and getting slaughtered, which is catastrophic. But there were people in the American military who saw the airplane as a way to change the bloody calculus of war. been contested on land and at sea. But by the 1930s, it was clear that the airplane was going to change that forever. Modern warfare will be fought as much in the air as on the ground. Well, the Americans are going to develop a new form of warfare, and that's what it was, a new form of warfare. And the idea was, why don't we develop an air force that can obviate the necessity for ground warfare? will fly over the standing armies to the industrial targets inside enemy territory and immobilize the war machine that makes warfare possible. So it's a very different way of fighting a war. Now, what they had was a theory, and they needed a delivering instrument. The Boeing company had been designing just such a plane, the B-17. It was the first four-engine bomber capable of penetrating deep into enemy territory and returning. The B-17 was a miracle plane as far as the Air Force was concerned. It was uh, faster, it was sturdier, and it had more firepower than anything that the Air Force had envisioned. It's bristling with machine guns. It's about as fast as any fighter at the time. In addition to that, it's a delivering instrument for tremendous numbers of bombs. With war in Europe looming, the Army Air Corps had ordered only 13 B-17s, the plane they called the Flying Fortress. Poland, September 1939. The German foe begins its ruthless march of conquest and sets the stage for World War II. Germany had established a massive military force with troops, tanks, and artillery. And in secret, they had built the Luftwaffe, the first modern air force with some of the most advanced aircraft ever built. The air ministries in London and in Washington were suddenly awakened to the fact, oh my God, are we ready? Are we prepared? So the first shock to the system is actually a defensive shock. Can we get ready? American President Franklin Roosevelt was caught between the reality of German aggression and American public opinion. This time America should keep out, and I know I will. And avoid all foreign entanglement. I think we should stay out of it entirely. Let you fight our own battle. They mean nothing to us. He has a Congress that doesn't want to talk about war, and a public which, is, which has said to itself, World War I, that was the war to end all wars. We're not going to go back to war again. But the threat became even more ominous as Germany unleashed its blitzkrieg on Denmark, Norway, 
Holland, Belgium, and France, and they all fell, leaving only the United Kingdom unconquered. The thing that would really ultimately touch Roosevelt's worldview was the threat that if Britain fell, that the Royal Navy would become a tool for Hitler's imperialism. And if that happened, if Hitler lands five divisions on our eastern seaboard, he can go all the way from the Alleghenies to the Rockies. There's nothing we can do to stop them. How is he going to be able to ramp this country up to fight a war that it had never fought before? Mechanized warfare, air power. He has no defense industry. They'd all been dismantled after World War I. The only option he had was to go to American business, the people who knew about production and knew about how you would be able to produce these kinds of new weapons of war, even if they'd never made them before, and to get them involved in the process. I want to make it clear that it is the purpose of the nation to build now with all possible speed every machine, every arsenal, every factory that we need to manufacture our defense material. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. This is what American industry, and particularly automobile industry and the aviation industry would become, an arsenal of democracy to arm the allies and also arm ourselves if war really came. Roosevelt called for America to build 50,000 airplanes. 50,000 American airplanes. People thought he was crazy, 50,000 planes. We only had an air force of 1,200 planes, and we had the 16th largest army in the world right behind Romania. So we're not ready. Troops are out there training with broomsticks. We have more horses than we have tanks. We're just not ready for this thing. To support the British and to prepare to defend the United States meant that America would wage a war of mass production. A bitterly competitive U.S. aircraft industry with rivals like Boeing, Douglas, and Lockheed would have to build each other's planes to meet the call to arm America and its allies. This was an unprecedented direction for American aviation companies. These were competitors for government contracts, for commercial contracts. But the war effort drew those companies together in ways that really hadn't happened before. Unprecedented cooperation. The orders were so large, 12,000 for the B-17 alone, that it transformed Boeing and all of American aviation from a collection of businesses into an industry. Aircraft, once produced by hand, now rolled off assembly lines. Huge modern factories sprang up across the country. Tens of thousands of workers were recruited, hired, and trained. And the number of plants only grew after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. After America entered the war, anyone who was of age was a soldier or a worker. It's as if an entire country stops and does nothing that isn't related to warfare. It's around the clock production. Lights never go out. Uh, the machines never stop. We had three shifts at the factory that I was at. Eight hours each, three different shifts, 24 hours a day. We in engineering slept at the factory five nights a week. We had rooms, we had a restaurant. And we went home Saturday night and Sunday night so we could see our girlfriends. You had women who had never worked in a factory before. And yet, by the war's end, one out of every three workers was a woman. My sister and I worked together, and uh, we see people getting dressed to go out, and we couldn't. We had to go to work. <laughs> and if we didn't feel like going to work, we had this record of Rosie the Riveter. She's making history, working for victory, Rosie. <laughs> And we'd wind that up and play that, and that boosted our morale, so we said, oh, okay, we gotta go. Let's go. <laughs> we wanted to get in there and be a part of it. 
The thousands of planes that rolled out of plants in every part of the country were designed and built to execute the doctrine of strategic bombardment, bomb the enemy's military and industrial base, and bring his war machine to a halt. That was the theory. High-altitude strategic bombing can knock the enemy's industrial machine out to the point where it can't fight the war any longer. So you need armadas, if you will, of bombers to attack these targets. Because on some days, you're going to hit two, three targets, maybe four, simultaneously. And you take some losses. So you have to have almost a pipeline, if you will, bringing planes into Great Britain throughout the war. These vast fleets of British and American bombers had been anticipated in the futuristic literature of the 1920s and the 1930s. The, the air was dark, as they would say in the novels, with bombers raining down death from the air. And yet now, something like that was true. It was mid-1942. The US Army Air Forces had arrived en masse in Britain, within range of the German heartland. Huge airfields now dotted the English countryside. Boeing B-17s, the flying fortresses, began to roll in. The B-17 arrival in Europe was met with great acclaim. The Americans showing up finally in 1942 was this great and then setting up the 8th Air Force and then bringing in the Flying Fortress, you know, was a great thing for the British people to observe. As time went on, we got more and more airplanes coming onto our base, more and more crews coming in. So yes, we were beginning to recognize that the production of B-17s back in the States had really picked up and was really rolling. The plan was for a massive, unrelenting bombing campaign, one that would finally test the idea that a war could be won by strategic bombardment of the enemy. They'll fly in a tight formation, and we will hit the enemy's strategic nerve points. And there's the theory, and now, Thank heavens, we have the weapons to do it. And then comes this decisive day in October 1943, where a very large group of B-17s fly off in perfect daylight to attack these vital German centers of ball-bearing production in Schweinfurt. They find themselves subject to the most astonishing set of attacks by the Luftwaffe, carefully coordinated with some fighters coming from below, some from above, some from directly ahead. And the result that day is devastating. 60 B-17 bombers wiped out. Schweinfurt was a terrible place to go because there was a ball bearing factory there. For every moving military vehicle or civilian vehicle rolls on ball bearings. So th this target was the most well defended. The German fighter pilots were plentiful and they were skilled. And so we got hit up pretty badly. We lost 60 airplanes. That meant 600 people didn't make it back home. And our own airplanes came back lost an engine, shot up pretty bad. Um, my partner in the left waist was killed. And that raid on Schweinfurt was one of the most devastating air battles in history and became known as Black Thursday. This was such a shock to the system that they really began to see how the bomber was supposed to get through and we were sure we had all the defensive preparation, but it doesn't look like that. So now this whole air war becomes, ironically, what it wasn't supposed to be, trench warfare in the sky. The very concept of a flying fortress, a self-defending bomber, 
was called into question. They wanted the B-17s and the rest of them to simply fight their way through, fight off the enemy fighters with defensive firepower, and, and succeed that way. It didn't work. You had to have fighter coverage. At stake was the entire Allied war effort. If the German military industrial base was invulnerable, its armies and air force would continue to dominate. You're not going to be able to actually land on D-Day. You're not going to be able to win the war in Europe, win the war at all, unless you have a long-range escorting fighter. And so they actually pull back for several months while they're scratching their heads. The whole air war is, you know, point, counterpoint, check, counter check. We need to figure out what to do. So in fact, although it's not well known, American strategic bombing of Germany grinds to a halt between late October of 1943 and the beginning of 1944, which is cutting it very late. The solution was a combination of American and British engineering and a bit of luck. Early in the war, the British had turned to North American Aviation's Dutch Kindleberger to build a fighter to challenge the German Blitzkrieg. Kindleberger said, I'll tell you what, you give me, you give me 100 days, and I will come up with not just a design for you, but I'll build you a prototype. You fly it around and see what you think. And in a record 102 days, North American designed and built what would become the P-51 Mustang a sleek, highly maneuverable modern fighter, but it had a problem. In their trials, they discover that while it is, it has many wonderful maneuverable uh, capacities and capabilities, it, it just doesn't seem totally effective over 19,000 feet. And our bombers and the American bombers especially are flying at 24,000 feet. So it can't protect them. Therefore, they think it's not going to work. So they actually turn to the most experienced test pilot from Rolls-Royce, and they bring Ronnie Harker down. And the story is, is, is quite gorgeous. It's almost a you know, Steven Spielberg movie. But then he says, I've noticed that the front end of this P-51 is about the same length that would take the brand-new, ultra-powerful Rolls-Royce 61 engine. So they set out to drop in the Rolls-Royce engine, build it up, and then Harbour takes it and flies it. And when he comes down, his report is just something that blows your mind. It blows the mind of any aerospace historian. He says, it's still as wonderful and maneuverable as ever, but now with this engine in, I can get it up to 40,000 feet and it can fly 440 miles an hour. I think this one can escort our bombers all the way to Berlin. And the transformation is something which itself is wonderful, the transformation of the balance of power in the air. Hermann Goring, commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, later remarked, the day I saw Mustangs over Berlin, I knew the war was lost. The decisive contest for air superiority over the entire European battlefield was waged over the winter and spring of 1944. Allied tactics changed with the arrival of the Mustangs. They no longer simply escorted the bombers, they took the fight directly to the Luftwaffe in the air and on the ground. Today's orders were pursue and destroy the enemy. The Mustangs and other Allied fighters like the P-47 and the P-38 were outfitted with additional fuel tanks and were able to range over almost all of the German countryside. One week in late February 1944 became known as the Big Week. We're about to hit the Nazis for six consecutive days and nights. The Allies hope to finally win air superiority over the Luftwaffe. The liberation of Europe was at stake. 
The big week set in motion the siege of Germany from the air that would continue until the end of the war in Europe. The Mustangs plunged into the fight. The Germans closed in. fighter battle raged across the European skies with victories by our fighters alone of 60, 85, and over 100 enemy aircraft destroyed each day. It was a battle with terrible costs on both sides. Scores of Allied planes and crew were lost. But the toll on the Luftwaffe was far greater. By the late spring, it had lost its air supremacy over the German homeland. With air domination itself at stake, the Luftwaffe disappeared from the skies. The domination of the American Air Force over the German countryside was so great that they could afford to shoot an enemy bicyclist carrying a dispatch. I mean, they had so many airplanes that they were looking for targets. Fighter bombers smash Nazi barges and railway trains. The fighter planes took out the transport. They took out the canals, the railroads, the trucks. The Germans couldn't get anything to anybody because there's no means to transport them. The bombers begin the invasion blow. Hitting... The Luftwaffe could no longer inflict the devastation on Allied bombers that just months before had brought Allied bombing to a halt. Great air fleets hitting German defenses. Thousands of tons of high explosives rain down. Watch, a road junction is hit. Can you imagine being a person in Germany, not thinking the war is going too well and wondering how it's going to come up, and then look and see a thousand B-17s? an unending stream of airplanes every day. It was called an air train. When the first plane hit German airspace, the tail was still in England. It was amazing. And then at evening time, they would come back for night raids and the ground would shake again. But the war was far from over. Controlling the skies and devastating the Nazi war machine cleared the way for the Allies' ground invasion of Europe. D-Day, June 6, 1944, was the largest Allied military operation of the war. 150,000 men landed on the French beaches at Normandy, and the decisive ground war with Germany began. And on that day, Germany could muster just 319 planes to counter the more than 12,000 Allied aircraft deployed during the invasion. And for the next year, fiercely contested battles were fought, but the Allies controlled the air above. And the German war machine was beyond repair. And I often think that there ought to be a monument for the over 18,000 airmen who were casualties in the five-month run-up to D-Day. That's double the number of casualties we took on the beaches on D-Day. In May 1945, Germany surrendered. The war in Europe was over. But that did not bring an end to World War II. The war against Japan continued. Japan, like Germany, had conquered vast stretches of territory. And the United States military believed that strategic bombardment would also be essential to defeating its Pacific enemy. But to destroy the Japanese industrial base, 
the U.S. would need a bomber that could fly much further than the B-17. In the Pacific, we had to operate over ranges that were much greater than the kind of ranges we had in Europe, over vast stretches of the ocean. You're going to need planes with fantastic range. And during the war, Boeing was developing just such a plane, the B-29, known as the Super Fortress. The B-29 was a four-engine super bomber that would travel farther and carry a bigger bomb load than any plane had done in history. This B-29, which is to be the bomber beyond all bombers, and it's going to be the ultimate war-winning machine if the war goes on. And remember, many planners thought that especially the war against Japan might not finish until 1947. When Japan attacked Pearl Harbor in December 1941, the B-29 was a design on paper. But once America declared war on Japan, the Army Air Forces wanted Boeing to start delivering them within two years at a rate of 25 a month. The construction of the factory, the design, the building of the prototype, the testing, and even the manufacturing would have to happen at virtually the same time. The plane was going to have to be mass produced and flown before the engineers even knew for sure that all of its complicated systems would work. In Wichita, Kansas, the plant that took shape was enormous. Built in the midst of wheat fields in just 18 months, thousands of workers were hired and trained. People had never seen an airplane, quite literally, had never seen an airplane firsthand uh, on the ground, were suddenly building this massive thing which required thousands and thousands of parts and miles of wiring. The B-29 represented a huge step away from the B-17. The B-17 had been unpressurized. I mean, the waste gunners in a B-17 were operating in the substratosphere in sub-zero temperatures with the windows open, as it were. Really a very tough way to fight a war. And so Boeing decided to build the B-29 as a pressurized airplane in the crew areas. Pressurization would allow the crew to breathe without oxygen masks and to fly in a temperature-controlled environment. They were so ambitious they said, not only will we have a pressurized cabin at the front of the aircraft, but at the rear of the aircraft, where the rear gunners will be, they also will be pressurized. How do you pressurize an entire cabin like that, a cabin that's spacious? Well, they come up with a tunnel idea, where you move from the cockpit to the back of the plane, crawling through a tunnel, so you don't have to pressurize the bomb bay. Constructing a plane that involved these kinds of technology and engineering challenges was something that involved enormous amount of effort. Nothing really had perplexed as many minds and as many companies as the B-29. It was not just an airplane. It was an industrial project of a size and scale that American industry had never engaged in. The Super Fortress was a collective national industrial effort on every level. There were thousands of subcontractors building everything from wheels to propellers to engines. The plane had over 40,000 different parts. Each B-29 had a million rivets holding it together. The mission of the B-29 was to bridge the expanse of the Pacific and eventually bring the kind of strategic bombing that had destroyed German industry to the Japanese heartland. But it had another deeply secret mission. If the Manhattan Project was successful, the project to develop the atomic bomb, then the B-29 would deliver it. The US government would spend more on the B-29 than any other weapon. The B-29 cost about $3 billion, and had it not worked, it would have meant that the next most expensive project, the atom bomb, which cost $2 billion, wouldn't have been deliverable. What happened in Wichita was going to determine the outcome of the war. Everything was to be more sophisticated than anything which had gone before. 
That means that you're in new territory and some of the things aren't going to work until you try it out and try it out. So there's delays, inevitable delays, and this is why it was called as a joke, so to speak, but it was a bittersweet joke. It was called the Battle of Kansas. Can we win the Battle of Kansas? And there was quite a question mark about this. The Battle of Kansas was a battle against time, and time was costing lives. In 1943, American forces were taking thousands of casualties as they fought their way island by island across the Pacific. But the B-29, the plane that would take the fight to the Japanese homeland, was still not ready. It's just a hugely complicated airplane, even for Boeing, which is used to building complicated airplanes. Because the B-29s are flying with huge engines, multi-bank rows of cylinders, the problem of cooling the cylinders at the back end of the engine just becomes horribly difficult. And engine fires become a real problem. Boeing's most senior test pilot, Eddie Allen, and a 10-man crew died on an early test flight when one of the B-29's engines caught fire. And along with Eddie Allen's death, also many believe that would be the end of the B-29 as a project, uh, that this was a plane that was unflyable, that this was a plane that had too many problems, was too dangerous to take up into the air, let alone to be sent into combat. Accidents, engine fires, Nothing halted the B-29's development and production. The war in the Pacific demanded a super fortress. The head of the Army Air Forces, General Hap Arnold, had staked his career on the B-29 and the idea that Japan could be bombed into surrender. Roosevelt is pressing Arnold, who in turn is pressing Boeing to get the plane on bases by early summer of 44. Pap Arnold was a, always presented as this lovely, smiling guy, you know, in the photo ops. But he was a tough manager, and he was on people fiercely, and he was on Boeing fiercely. The D-Day in the Pacific is set for June 1944 and is going to be Saipan. The three islands of the Marianas, Saipan, Virginia, and Guam, and we're going to locate bases there to attack Japan. But Arnold wants the, the bomber before that. He wants to test it out. Arnold arrived in Wichita in March 1944, expecting to take delivery of more than 150 B-29s. He fully expected these bombers to be ready. And he was told when he got there, we ain't ready. <laughs> and not only that, we don't know when we're going to be ready. He just exploded. But Arnold is an inventive guy and he is a possibilist, he's a doer. And he said, even if it's 96% ready, we need it. We need it, we need it now. And so he rushes in, extra help, and it's called the Kansas Miracle. It, just a little over a month, uh, he's able to have his planes operational. By the summer of 1944, factories were producing more than 50 B-29s a month and they were heading for the Pacific. It was just two and a half years since the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. The super fortresses were arriving in the Pacific theater by the dozens, and then by the hundreds. Well, the B-29 was such a beautiful plane. And I interviewed guys who said they'd go out on the base like a kid going out, you know, um, waxing and um, shining up his car and shine the wing up and it glistened. It was a gorgeous plane. The pilots had to deal with enormous aircraft full of fuel, full of bombs, full of armor plating. It's bigger and takes lots of handling. You have to think about the speed at which it takes off, the speed at which it comes in. 
With their bomb bays packed with the heaviest loads in history, the B-29s barreled down newly constructed runways for one of the most dangerous parts of the mission, takeoff. They would kind of wobble in the air, and everybody on the ground was saying, oh my god. But once airborne, flying from bases on newly conquered islands like Saipan and Tinian, the B-29 proved itself the aerial weapon it was designed to be. The plane could stay airborne for 17 hours. Now that's really crucial when you're flying over the open, empty Pacific with all those sharks. They're flying in the, you know, at 30,000 feet. In winter, it's 62 degrees below zero over Japan. No part of the Japanese Empire is now out of our range. No war factor too remote to feel our bombs. The battle for Japan is now underway with full speed ahead. Once the bitterly contested volcanic island of Iwo Jima fell, just 700 miles from the Japanese mainland, North American P-51s could enter the battle as fighter escorts and attack aircraft. By the spring of 1945, much of the Imperial Air Force was destroyed. And the B-29s were attacking from as little as 5,000 feet, making the bombing more accurate and more devastating. Tokyo was in ruins. But the Emperor of Japan even after seeing the destruction for himself, refused to command his military to surrender. The war in the Pacific went on. In May and June 1945, the army had the greatest number of its casualties ever since the Civil War in taking the islands of Okinawa. On Okinawa, the emperor's soldiers and civilians endured relentless bombing, but they still would not surrender. The calculations of how many casualties the army and Marine Corps would take landing on the home islands of of Japan were just enormous. Every soldier, sailor, and pilot in the Pacific War had the same hope resting on the B-29. Make the Japanese Imperial Armed Forces surrender before an invasion. The turning point in the war was a day without precedent in all of history. On August 6th, 1945, a B-29 named Enola Gay flew the 1,500 miles from a base on the island of Tinian to Hiroshima. It dropped the first atomic bomb, followed by the bombing of Nagasaki on August 9th. Aboard the battleship USS Missouri, on September 2nd, the Japanese surrendered. There would be no invasion. The once untested theory of strategic bombardment had proven decisive. The war was over.
But the legacy of World War II was not to be the machines and the weapons that were built to wage it. The 12,000 B-17s and 4,000 B-29s were instruments of victory. But they were soon eclipsed by even more innovative and sophisticated technology. The enduring legacy of the war is the industry that was created to build them. The factories, the plants that were the arsenal of democracy, they became the industrial engine for generations to follow. <laughs>